quite simple. It's quite readily defined. We're a firm that's 16 years old. It was formed by two men, Aaron Mitchell and Armella Jurgula, to do one project, which was a small exhibit building on Cape Hatteras, Kitty Hawk, to house a model of the Wright brothers' first aircraft and to have an exhibit with it. Now, as Marvin explained, we have two offices, one in New York and, Phil and one in Philadelphia. We have more partners. We have about 60 professionals, most of them quite young. However, despite the change, we essentially have the same concerns that we did 16 years ago. And we are dominated by the same two men. But now we have greater, greater opportunities. We have a great diversity of clients and projects. As a matter of fact, it is impossible to say that any two projects are the same. And we benefit by thereby being able to have a completely fresh attitude towards each project. We have done many educational projects for colleges, universities, and a few schools. We have done some buildings for large corporations, primarily office buildings. We have done very few projects for the government, mainly the National Park Service. We have done some residential work, a handful of houses, a small amount of housing. And recently, we have gotten involved in industrial work. And our practice has expanded from being a national practice to an international practice. The office itself is, is organized on project teams with three to 10 people per team. Each team is headed by a partner or an associate. We have administrative support through some technical people, such as a specification writer and various office personnel, secretarial and accounting and so on. And the only two people that really work on every project in this firm are Aaron Mitchell and Romaldo Jurgla. In approaching a project, we, we work through a series of phases, the first being a schematic phase where you analyze the client's program and needs, and you formulate a concept. We then go into a preliminary phase where we take that concept and we develop the design into a building. The next phase is into working drawings where we actually document what that building is so it can be constructed. It is bid, and during construction, we review things called shop drawings which contractors submit to us of various details, and we do site supervision. And the reason we do that is so that we can make sure that the building is being constructed in accordance with the intent of the contract documents. Through all this, we have each individual will work on every single phase. We do not have any specialists. We have no person drafting who is given some yellow tracing and draws things up. We have no expert person at putting things together. We like to think of the individual as being a complete architect and thereby get the benefit of his being able to be, have a hold of the entire project. And thereby we have minimal roles and role planning and minimal hierarchy. In discussing motivation and philosophy, it really escapes definition. And yet it really is most important as far as we're concerned. Architecture is an expression of life. 
It is not an engineered solution to a problem, nor is it an application of some sort of theory or methodology. It's more complex than that. It can best be defined through illustrations and, and examples, but generally speaking, let me describe it this way. That first, you must attain a feel for what is the essence of the concerns of the program and the client's needs. You must have a functional understanding of it, but most importantly, you have to discover what are the dominant issues of that particular problem. It could be anything. There is no, no key thing that one always picks out in order to express what, what we wish our buildings to be. It could be, the, the context could be the overriding thing, or the mass, the program mass of the building, or the activity within the building, or the human condition within the building. It could be the interrelationship of the parts, or combinations of all these things. It should be considered something as a in totally inclusive thing. But whatever it is, it is a fragment, a fragment in time and a fragment in place. And so that it really does not even have any limits. It relates to everything. Once you have realized the essence of this, you then can establish a hierarchy of what you wish to express, or what seems the most relevant thing to express. And you express it in architectural terms. This becomes the formal statement of what you're gonna do. Everything else from there falls in place. It will follow suit. It either should strengthen the design, if, if the basic part T is valid. And each element becomes a supporting elephant either by modifying what you're doing or if it's something that is subordinated by the basic concept, then it can modify the basic concept through contrast by creating tensions. All this is done through an application of imagination and then persevering with critical discipline. Therefore, the projects that I'm gonna show you, I would not want you to think of them just as photographs of buildings, but I'd rather have you think of them as architectural expressions of selected but inclusive concerns. The first two projects I'm gonna show are two libraries of a very different size. One has a very simple program, the other one has a more complex one. But they both have the same general approach. Could I have the first slide, please? This is a small library in Boston, Massachusetts. The program consisted of three elements. A meeting room, an adult reading room, and a children's reading room. In looking at it, we also were faced with a site for which it was not enough mass to fill the site. So our approach was both one stimulated by sight or coping with sight and concentrating on the activity of the building. The square volume, which is elevated, is the meeting room, and below that are the two reading rooms separated by the stair leading to the upper meeting room. The lower spaces are those of day-to-day -day activity relating to the, to the outdoor park area. The upper place is more of a utilitarian meeting sort of place. Could we have the next slide, please? The, 
the building above this, the, above the horizontal definition there is the, that part of the building is the meeting room, and the lower part is divided into these two reading rooms. Next, please. The adult reading room relates to the park area outside. Next, please. And those windows, the lower ones, would be the ones that relate to the outdoor park. Next, please. The next, please. The exterior of the building is is not defined as being highly expressive. We concentrated mainly on the interior. One, next, please. And the next, please. And the next, please. The reading rooms are given their character by the activity within them, the books, the wood furniture, and natural light, which goes around where the, the upper meeting room block imposes itself on the reading room space below. Next, please. So that we've used light as well as the activity and the furnishings to become the principal the essence of this design in terms of, of its character. Next, please. Next, please. Check out area at the entrance. Next, please. The stair that separates the adult reading room from the children's reading room. Next, please. The next project is a combination of a law library and the law school at the University of Washington in Seattle. The program called for mock courtrooms and some offices for the law school and a reading room and stacks for the library. The site is at an edge of the campus oriented along a mall and the whole project was to be developed in two phases. In this situation we again felt that the essence was the activity of the reading rooms, the courtrooms, and a student lounge. And so the two lower floors, we, on the two lower floors, this one and that one, we had the, the courtrooms there, the library reading room there, offices relating to that over here. And on the upper floors, we had the offices for the, the law school and stack area above. This is the basement just with a mechanical space here. Because of the, the linear, the necessity for expansion and for the way it related to the site, the scheme became linear. So in the former library where we had the stairs separating these kind of activities, in this case, we had to find a street and a service core that separates them. Next, please. This just illustrates more of the offices and the stacks and the service core. And on the top level, mechanical and some more offices related to the law school. What this allowed was that on the site, the, the north is, is to the top here. 
and allowed you to reinforce this whole distribution by orienting it to the site and that the light as it played on these individual spaces became the meaning for the architecture. Next, please. In section, north is over that way, south this side. The, re the courtrooms and the reading room in here. The street going through here, the service core there. Next, please. What has actually been built to date is just this much here. This indicates the, the mall coming from the heart of the campus over there. This is the terminus, which is a major roadway. And we felt that you had many things that, that worked for this one linear scheme. You had the phasing, you had the offices on one side, the library on the other side, and the fact that it has such a strong relationship to this small space here. Next, please. The south side thereby gains a, a sculptural quality in that you have special concerns for sun control for the offices. Next, please. This shows in section, we're just looking at this side here. It allows you within the, within the interface of the inner spaces here and the exterior to incorporate not only sun control, but mechanical that feeds into those spaces and so on. Whereas on this side, it's a much more straightforward application with north light coming in. Next, please. This is the south elevation with the sunscreens. Next, please. A little more detail. Next, please. The entrance in the street, do you come in, you enter up into the internal street here. Next, please. The north side with the reading room and the windows to the reading room in here, the stacks all along there. So that in the one building you can have a flat side and you can have a very sculptural side. And the two are part of the whole building in that they complement each other through their contrast. Next, please. This is the reading room here. The courtrooms, which are solid, closed interior spaces with an entrance through here to go into the street from, from this part of the campus over this on the north side. Next, please. And a few funny details at the entrance. Next, please. And yet the entrance is is quite easily recognizable, even though this is not the major one. Next, please. And the end, which on the end you have the service spaces so that you can serve along the core, feeding in here and servicing the building through this core. Next, please. Details of the service entrance and the end of the reading room on the upper level. Next, please. This is the street on this side of the courtrooms, on this side the student lounge. Next, please. Unfortunately, the, the, we do not have any photographs of the building completely finished and occupied. This is the, the edge towards the student lounge down in here. Next, please. But, well, can you go back to that last one when I'm well, no, that's all right. We'll get it later. That's a good one. Now that I mix you up. <laughs> what, you're, what you're looking into here is, is back into the street. That you actually, this slide is switched around the direction that you're looking so that the street is in there. Next, please. This is the courtroom or the lecture rooms. 
in the next a detail of the acoustic finish back there. Next, please. And this is the reading room, but it's under construction, so the windows that are here and are here, you do not see. This is actually the north side, so this would all be very light. And this is a clear story light, but protected by the rest of the building that goes up there, so that this space would be flooded with light. Next, please. And this gives you an idea of the, of the columns going up and so that you have the implication of the high space with the lights coming in. And then the, the space down here, which is more the reading. Next, please. Okay, this, now, this next project is, is a different kind of, of building. It's a dormitory for Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts. But the approach, a linear approach, was used here also. This building, sorry, can you, I, I hope you can see the slide better than I can, but the, the, uh, the building that I'm talking about is this one right in here. The campus is in a completely typical New England town, rural type setting. This street goes through the heart of the town, and the heart of the, of the college is right here. This building is, the site was at the edge of the campus. The land falls down as it goes back that way. And this worked very well with the particular program. Because what this dormitory had to be was it was a, the college is an all men, men college and they were going co-ed and they wanted a dormitory for girls and they wanted to have a lot of girls. And so that the mass became, became considerable for a site which is so rural. And our approach was because you have the because you have the slope of the hill, if you could spread the spread the building out so that it formed the edge of the campus and it was set down at the, the bottom of the slope, but then the mass would not impose itself on the campus, and only when you got close to the building would you realize how large it actually was. Next, please. And what this has is that this is this is towards the heart of the campus here. The it has access and its street along here, with access to service core, if you want to call it that, along here. This is a series of stairs that then go and serve a number of suites and rooms that relate to each of those suites. So you have a horizontal circulation and a vertical connection to each of the suites. And then in the front of it, you have a special dining pavilion. And the, the hill slopes down over this way. Next, please. This just gives a little bit more of the, the idea that on the here you have service spaces, some mechanical and storage and things like that. And here you have the the uh, dining building and with some meeting rooms also, commons buildings, really what you call it. And the stair towers coming down there and some single rooms over on that edge there. Next, please. And this is the typical room and uh, typical floor after you come up the stairs so that you do have potential for through circulation, but you don't use it because the suites are each controlled. This formulates a suite, for instance. Here it has four bedrooms and a, a, a living room, and that would be typical for each. Next, please. This gives a slightly better idea of the individual rooms related to the 
to the one common room for that particular suite. And the stair comes up and you can see that it serves as the front door to this suite and to those over there and sort of a back door and a back escape to this suite here and that suite there. Next, please. <clears throat> Inside, the rooms are, are quite basic in that they have the beds, the desks, the closets, and so on. And that, that really, if you're using the living space, the living space becomes more important than the actual bedroom, which is bedroom and study. Next, please. This gives maybe a better idea of how the, the building reaches out almost as a way of, if you put your hands like that to, at the edge of the, of the campus falling away. Next, please. This is looking from the heart of the campus down at the buildings. Actually, at first, when you when you come along the rise, you sort of just see the top of the building above that line, and as you come closer, you it starts to, to grow on you. Next, please. This is the major entrance through the Commons building. Next, please. You come across through across a bridge here, and then this is you actually are in a on a bridge going through the upper level of the common spaces, which open out in here. Next, please. Some of the resultant geometry. Next, please. Next, please. The material is, is precast concrete. For all the enclosures of the upper levels, important place for the lower levels. Next, please. Each, each one of these represents the, the basic room. Next, please. Some of the detail. Next, please. The basic going up into the service card. Or the Next, please. This is in the Commons cafeteria area. Next, please. This is the way you walk in, the entrance there, and spaces that you can come out and look down into this space. Next, please. That shows that relationship again clearer. Next, please. You'll notice that they, after the building was built, they made a co-ed instead of all women. And the next, please. And we find that, that this has become one of the most popular places on the campus. They don't like the, they didn't really like, haven't adjusted to the building yet. And they consider it a bit austere, but they do find the, uh, they find the uh, cafeteria area a very pleasing environment, and especially the way it relates to the exterior. Okay, now I want to, to, that just is sort of like a brief survey, I guess, and now I'd like to go into some of the ramifications of program by illustrating two projects that had a very complex program. This first one is one that I suspect most of you know here. This is uh, Columbus East High School in Columbus, Indiana. The we were given a program written by an, an educator from Ohio State for a school which had never been actually designed, a, a type of school that had never been designed before. It was a complete departure from the more traditional 
classroom corridor situation. The basic idea was to take the day and divide it up into modules, which could be 15 minutes long, 12 minutes, 19 minutes, whatever you wish. And then through a computer program, develop a number of uh, schedules, something like 200 schedules or 300 schedules or whatever, to have as a maximum amount of variation to fit the student's needs. And in order to accomplish this, they had to, they had three basic elements three different kinds of, of learning spaces, three kinds of activities. The first were group reaction rooms, which could have as many as, as 250 students. The second, which is a lecture, basically. The second is a seminar room where they'd have discussions with faculty members. And this would be for a group size of around 15. And the third for, was for individual study, where a student could go and pursue things on his own, or see a member of the faculty and do research, or not research necessarily, but some special projects. And, and or also to have a lot of free time in which they would spend in a, what they call a resource center or a library. Now there were certain elements to the program that did not fit within that basic concept for one reason or another. They were a gymnasium, pool, auditorium, industrial arts, planetarium, and a TV studio. And supporting that, there are certainly admission, uh, certain administrative functions, commons area, and the arrival, and those sort of things. Well, we what was interesting to us about this particular program and what, what stimulated the design was that the level of activities became, became so important and it was the interrelationship between these activities that gave the building its character. And so we took the basic approach that we would try to express these kinds of activity. Again, we used a linear gallery or a linear street or internal street as an organizing element. And then on either side of it, we had the group reaction areas and the commons area at the entrance, at the entrance level. And at the, each end of this street, we clustered, I say the gymnasium and the pool. And at the other end, the auditorium and the industrial arts. And it was at this lower level where most of the activity would occur. And then you would connect through vertical circulation through stairs to the next floor. Next slide, please. Which we called the group interaction or the seminar rooms. And you would still have a visual connection between the group reaction and the seminar type spaces. And this is just the upper areas of those big massive uh, volumes there. And you would continue further up. Next slide, please. To where you have another horizontal circulation with access to a double story resource center or IMC, inter module, I can't remember what it is, but it's one of the technical jargon. Uh, and then you could go up further, the next slide please, to the one-to-one -one relationship. And in here you would have nodes, which would be business, let's say, in foreign languages and math and English. And this would all be sort of open space and you would, people would relate to, to whatever they were involved with. Well, these are the first studies that we ever did with this, and the building didn't end up quite like this. We, we kept the lower level pretty much the same, but we took this, and we felt that if you put the one-to-one -one activities on the top, 
that it would be sort of a, a dead situation that people might not go there. They wouldn't want to go up. They'd much rather go down to the commons or something like this. And this really was the heart of the whole building. So instead, we put this at the second floor, and we put the seminar rooms on the third floor. Next slide, please. This is still the old old scheme. I forgot I had this slide, but this is the this was the group reaction, the seminar rooms, and the one to one individual study, and we put that down in here and this up there, and we took out that circulation and just had one circulation with the point of arrival Commons group reaction. Next, please. That scheme on the site was initially drawn as this, where down at this, this is, this gives you an idea of the, the individual study platforms, you might call it. This end, gymnasium, pool there. And at that time we had the planetarium pulled out, auditorium industrial arts. There was a big bypass road going through here, which formulated one edge of the site, although there were athletic fields on the other side, and we had a proposed bridge to come across that, that road. Next, please. That site changed to, to this. The, you can see the bumps up here, and those represent the seminar spaces. You can see the stairs there, four stairs. We found in the other scheme we had too many stairs. So instead we had, which were stairs with light wells. So we took light wells instead as this basic vertical organization that light was as important as the circulation. We put the pool up there, the gymnasium here. And they were all fed by this outdoor lobby or outdoor room. The other end, we had an indoor lobby to the auditorium, and we put the industrial arts back there. Back in here was the basic, the, the edge with the residential community, and in here we had an outdoor space relating to the commons below. On this side, we had a arrival for buses, which come in not in one place, but in four places for students, and in one place here as the, the formal entry to the school. Next, please. The first floor plan is essentially this. This is the outdoor room. This is the street. This is the indoor lobby. The auditorium, industrial arts, pool, gymnasium. Then these lecture halls of the group reaction became quite solid blocks that you entered in between. And then we took the planetarium and equated that to the base, and we took the TV studio and equated that to these group reaction sort of spaces. And we even went so far as to take the bookshop and, and make it in that same kind of vocabulary. On this side, we had the administration, the commons area, and the cafeteria, with the kitchen in there, and then the industrial arts in behind there. The reason for separating the industrial arts, for instance, was because of the noise. The reason for separating the auditorium, again, was for acoustic isolation. Otherwise, they, they might have somehow been integrated in a better way to this kind of a system. The reason for the gymnasium was just because it was such a large volume, and for the pool because it was also shared by the community. Next, please. The first floor appears somewhat like this. These are the light wells. Up on there is this internal street. Stepping down, you're, you're standing in the commons, looking down into the cafeteria. There's the serving line with the kitchen behind. Out through the windows, the industrial arts wing. We found that underneath the light wells, there was opportunity to create special gathering places for students to sit and talk and so on. And underneath the, the street, we have lockers, which is the only thing that a student really has as any kind of homeroom sort of thing. He has a locker. Next, please. 
These are some other views of this first level. Next, please. This is looking down at the locker level. Some lockers here, and but most of them underneath there. Next, please. This gives an idea of the, the way these became gathering places for the students. Next, please. And they actually use them. It's not just words. Next, please. This is looking, the actual the streets up there, but just looking at the vertical space that connects the two and from the locker level looking up. Next, please. <clears throat> Going up the stair, which we still have light coming down, but the stairs basically are in closed spaces, to the second floor. Next, please. On the second floor, here are the stairs. Around each stair, we took those previous nodes, which were business and foreign language and English and whatever it is, that the nodes were here. We had this diagonal pattern, which meant that you just didn't have a big open floor, but you started to have some spatial closure to the whole thing. And over on this side, we had the resource center, so that, that these could all overflow into that, and that could overflow into this, and there was a very free sort of space. But it did not have any circul major circulation through it. Along the edge, we had those kind of spaces that would relate to this, but had to be separated for one reason or another. For example, typing machines for acoustics and some lab spaces, lab spaces because of smells and, and so on, and a few conference rooms. The, this enabled if you look at this organization, what it allowed you to do is if you were basically taking a, or concentrating on a science program, that you generally would use the spaces above this for science seminar spaces, and you'd use the spaces below it for the large group pertaining to science. And if you were down here with business, the, you would have this, you'd have the same sort of relationship, so that it was all vertical circulation, not horizontal. Next, please. This is an idea of that space. This is the, we have reinforcing this diagonal between nodes. This is one of the nodes. Uh, we had this clear story lighting, so the space again would be broken up vertically as well as horizontally. The node would have places for exhibits for that particular department and you'll see in another slide what they will what they have for the, for the identification of that particular node and then out in this area there were our carol study carols open table areas which can be completely rearranged in any way that they wanted and next please This gives you an idea of a node for the business education, that they would have an area where students would come and check out materials to take to a carol to study, for instance. Next, please. And also on the other side near the, near the light wells were open conference areas for discussion groups. Next, please. And even the teachers did not get any offices. They also had freestanding carol type spaces so that a teacher was always available for a student. And we designed these modules so that the teacher could you know, would have a desk and place to put his, his materials. And back here, although you can't see it, was a bench for a student to come in and students should be able to come to the teacher uh, quite readily. Next, please. And the third level is a stepping of the seminar spaces. And by stepping this, them this way, we had a way of breaking down the scale and at the same time creating outdoor seminar spaces as well for larger groups. And 
which case you would look over the bus area out into a, a cluster of trees over this way and out on the playing fields. Next, please. Unfortunately, I don't have good slides of this. Can you focus that at all? Or? But essentially, on one edge is a hard edge. This is the only place you really feel the length of the building. And then off the other side is, is a softer edge as the room's breaking away. And in here, the entrances to the stairwells coming up. Next, please. And these are the outdoor spaces. Looking over into the trees. Next, please. This basic separation of activities was related to the selection of materials and the expression of materials also. At the lower level where the buses come in would be the solid blocks of the, of the group reaction would be defined in, in masonry, basically a material relating to the ground. The entrance to the stairs. The second level was defined in this metal panel. These, these small rooms along the perimeter that had to be isolated are directly behind that and have these small portholes for looking out. And the third floor, and then they'd also have a skylight here which washes the inside of that wall. Then the, and, but there was a potential for closing those off so they could darken these rooms and, and so on. And the third floor is the seminar space, the seminar rooms, and each of these bumps represents a particular seminar space. Next, please. This is the formal entrance going to the outdoor room, the gymnasium here, the planetarium there, the individual one-to-one -one floor, seminar floor. Next, please. Another view looking along the length of the building. Next, please. From the other end. Next, please. This is all, all used for arrival from buses with the entrance to the auditorium down here, and this is the lost space of the auditorium. Next, please the entrances and the stair. These these doors go to, to the stair directly. Here you would you would climb these stairs and enter there. That's a glass enclosure and immediately go onto the street. Next please. At night gives you more of an idea of how transparent that actually is. And the band, the light from the second floor coming out the, the skylit window there. Next, please. And looking along the bus arrival area, benches, built-in benches where the students can sit and wait for the bus. Next, please. The outdoor room, gymnasium here, academic building here, the one-to-one -one space, uh, and so on. Originally, this was this whole space was to be broken up and, and more materials using pavers of that kind of material mixed with concrete. And unfortunately, it had to be negotiated out during bidding. And the hope is that this space will become much more of an outdoor exhibit space and that, that the students will actually erect an exhibit structure and so that we really have activity on there. And there is a lot of activity about every 15 minutes, which is the length of the module, but there's not any lasting activity at the moment. Next, please. This is looking at the entrance into the gymnasium. Next, please. It's the entrance to the pool, again, off the outdoor room. Next, please. The interior part of the pool, glass all the way around it. And in the pool, we have an inflatable roof so that in the summer months, they can take that off and it actually can be an outdoor pool. 
and the reason the reason to do that was not just to, to have the, the tricky idea of taking a roof off, but as a way of having translucence within the pool all year round and have it a bright light sort of space. Next, please. On the other side, there's the commons area the library or the, the resource center in these two parts with a porch, three porches. This relates to the art area down there, this one to the resource area here. Pool building over there. Next, please. More detail looking at the pool building. Next, please. Detail of the construction, the modular system of the panels, doors from the commons area to the outdoor space. Next, please. Okay. Now, another another project that's involved very extensive programming. And again, would be interesting, or is interesting to us because of the intricacies of the program, is a, is a project that we've been working on for many years. The first part of it, we, it, it's a museum for the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. There was an existing building, which is this shape. And then at one point in time, it had an addition and another addition. And eventually, this was supposed to represent one quarter of the entire museum. It was supposed to, if you take an axis here, if you could double that over here and then bend the whole thing back again by that axis over there, it was supposed to be the, the size of this museum. Well, I got it started and I never finished it. And it, at that time, it was supposed to be both the university and the city museum. Well, originally, we were asked to, to design a, an addition which would include a children's gallery, a cafeteria lounge, which is actually above this floor here, a lecture room, and some laboratories and offices and library. The laboratories, office, and library were primarily related to the academic part and the children's area and the cafeteria area and so on was related to the museum. Next, please. This is, that, this is the floor just below the one you had just to show exactly where the lecture hall is. What we had to do is to, to uh, find a way of, okay, first of all, grouping the, the museum-related spaces below and the academic spaces above, which would be less accessible. And we used a courtyard as the basic orienting space to the whole museum. <clears throat> Next, please. Just run through these quickly to give you an idea. This is, at this point down below where you first looked was a, an arrival for school buses for children from the, from the various schools. They would come into a, a reception area. They would go and be told about what they were gonna see and then be taken through the museum to see it. At lunchtime, they had a children's cafeteria over here. This is the lounge uh, cafeteria in the center of the courtyard, which is there and there and there. Next, please. And on the upper floors, you have the laboratories in the inner part and the offices around the perimeter. And the yellow, the yellow represents a circulation system trying to relate to the circulation of the building that already existed. It so happened that you couldn't get to this, at the, the lower level of this space without going down, up through here, around a little passage down there into the catacombs of the building and people never even knew it was there. Next, please. This is just the upper level showing the more office areas above, but this breaks above the basic line of the museum itself. Next, please. And one even more level way up high. Next, please. 
In section then, you have the children's arrival point and the, the dining area there, the, the uh, offices, and over here, if you, this section, this section is just cut a little deeper than that one, a little further in, where you have the library relating to the offices. Arrival, offices above, cafeteria lounge, courtyard, courtyard. Next, please. And on the exterior, this is the library here, the strips of offices there, more service offices down here, delivery entrance down in here. Next, please. Just a little more head-on view of that. Next, please. The, unfortunately, I have no good slide. This is over in there is where the bus arrival is. Next, please. This is the bus arrival and the space in looking through the glass to the interior space. Next, please. This is the reception, not for children. The cafeteria area above up there. Next, please. Looking down from the cafeteria area to the bus arrival area down there. And next, please. This is the library. Next, please. More stack area in the library. There's an internal stair in the library itself. Next, please. Upper level in the library, and you can look down into the galleries down through there. Next, please. This is the courtyard. The cafeteria lounge in there, the circulation corridors you saw coming along here, cutting over. This is the existing building. The dome is down over here. We had to do a special model of this because the client was terrified that we were using concrete. And we've also often been asked, why did you use masonry in the exterior and the concrete on the interior? The masonry in the exterior is really necessary in order to make it feel as if it's not stuck on. But on the interior, the space is what ties the whole thing together. And therefore, you have the liberty to contrast what is new against what is old through the materials. And here's a situation where you get this contrast reinforcing the vitality of the building. Next, please. This is, unfortunately, I don't have a very good slide of the interior court. This is the diagonal bridge going across the inner courtyard. Next, please. Same, a little bit different view. Next, please. I do some of the concrete work, which isn't really, well, here it looks okay, but a lot of it was quite bad. Next, please. This is the cafeteria area there, a lower entrance from the museum over in here. Next, please. But what I really wanted to show you about this project was what we were asked to do later. When we did the, when we designed the original academic wing, we said, well, you know, we really think you ought to do a master plan. And they said, well, that's very nice, but uh, we really, can't afford to pay you to do a master plan right now. We need our academic wing. And so we ended up doing the master plan after the academic wing was completed. And so we had to live with it in that regard. But what we were asked to do was to, to really look in a comprehensive way at, their, at the way they were having their exhibits. They had an opportunity with the bicentennial coming of getting some money to help finance doing great things in the, with their exhibits. And <clears throat> they had a, a, an idea of, of creating a number of different kinds of exhibits. The, the, the exhibits that they had had there were quite static, that they were just objects 
around, which were all very nice. As a matter of fact, they were fascinating things, but they really didn't seem to have much relationship to each other, except that this group came from one place and this group came from another. And what they wanted to do was to have really two different types of galleries. One would be a continuation of the kind of galleries that they have, which were what they call their, their resources or their treasures. And they would take the very best material, like their Mesopotamian gold or their Egyptian collection, and have that in one place. But then they wanted to create something that would relate, and, and, and then, well, excuse me, to go back to that, that they would really design, have this design you know, as carefully as possible for a long-term resource. And then they would have another kind of gallery which would would be timeless. It would always it would always be relating to to us on a contemporary level. And so it would be rotating exhibits. And they would or or what they call theme exhibits. And one of the themes, for instance, they had a war and peace theme, and that you could show war and peace in different societies and related to today's concerns about war and peace. And they had two classifications of these theme exhibits, those which were really quite short term, you know, changing maybe three to six months, and those which would be more long term, <coughs> maybe changing once every one or two years. At the same time, they would be able to incorporate things like African dancing with their African exhibits and things like that. Well, it was very, it's a very exciting kind of program. But the building by this time was really very difficult to work with, especially in terms of circulation, because as I explained before, this building was supposed to be four times as large as it is there. What had happened is in the, in the old plan, this was supposed to be the major entry. Well, as it was being used, this became the major entry. And yet, this space here was really a very calm, tranquil courtyard with a pool in it and a place you'd like to go out and sit, but not necessarily a place that you want everybody to walk through. Whereas this one had a big, a big drive coming in. Can you, I, can you put that up a little bit? So, well, no. Let's go to the next. Well, no. Wait a second. We have another slide that'll show this more clearly, but. Um, they had a big ceremonial drive in here, and this was really very clearly the major entrance. But the problem was that you couldn't get from there to the exhibits without going in a fire stair or an elevator. Because what was going to be built over in here was never built, which was supposed to be a super large rotunda through which you came up. And so we, we had to look at the building and, and we said, well, now what if we, so what is the, the center of, of all this? Well, this is the center of it. And we said, what if we took that space and made it a three-story gallery? And thereby you would have a gallery here and there, which could be an introduction to all the potentials of the museum. And that as you came to each floor, you would know what you could go see from that as you went away from that particular place, whether it was treasure or theme or whatever. And so this is the basic approach. The, the other aspects that, that weighed heavily in favor of this entrance here was that uh, there had recently been a parking garage also designed by us over here, which meant a lot of people would be arriving from this side. The students now with the new academic wing were coming on this side. And even though the university was over there, there was sort of a balance between, between these, these people coming. So that's essentially what we did. And we created this, and then we made this the theme gallery, and that the theme short-term theme galleries. And then we made these the longer-term theme galleries. Short-term, short-term, 